Welcome to week four of our series, Cancel, Cancel Culture. And this, my friends, is the last dance. This is the, the walk-off. This is the last one in the series. And if you're new to the series, let me kind of unpack for you what we've been talking about. We've talked about how cancel culture occurs when someone says something they shouldn't say or does something they shouldn't do. Usually on social media, though it can be here in the real world too. And cancel culture happens when someone hears someone say something that they shouldn't say or do something they shouldn't do, and they hear it, and then they respond in an angry, vitriolic, fiery way. It's almost like a fire started and then people just go, oh, and they just start pouring fuel on the fire, <sighs> making it worse. And then we said oftentimes in cancel culture too, it doesn't just stop there. It actually, the person that's offended or hurt or recognizes that someone said something they shouldn't say, they go, wait, hold on, I'm gonna go recruit some help. And they go get kind of like this angry mob of people to come against the person who says something they shouldn't say or did something they shouldn't have done. And the whole thing blows up. And then the person <laughs> that said something they shouldn't say or did something they shouldn't do, they get canceled. You said something you shouldn't say, cancel. You did something you shouldn't do, cancel. We don't like you anymore, canceled. We don't wanna follow you anymore, canceled. You better not show your face again, canceled. And it's harsh. And <laughs> I mean, there's this notion that like somebody immediately becomes unforgivable, unredeemable. We've talked about how with, with some people, like they have, may have said something they shouldn't have said or done something they shouldn't have done, but then like their life gets ruined over it. People start making death threats. I mean, it's grim. It, I mean, it gets real. This is, <laughs> this is one of the tragic things about cancel culture. And we've said throughout the series that when we cancel someone and we don't want to hear from them again or see from them again or just pretend they don't exist, one of the problems is that we deny them a certain level of humanity. Because we believe that people are created in the image of God and can change and can be, and be moved. And cancel culture does not allow for that. You're canceled. And so there, there's problems to this. I mean, there's no grace. I mean, as, especially as followers of Jesus, it's problematic if we're starting to just get angry, recruit mobs, and just cancel people. Because again, there's no grace. There's no mercy. There's no forgiveness. And I, I would argue there's no beauty in just canceling somebody. It's way easier to destroy or tear something down than it is to restore something or make something new. So just let that park away. Just think about that. Way easier to destroy, tear something down than it is to repair or to make it new. My wife and I bought a house married two years ago, I believe two years ago. And it was kind of like had old lady vibes. I'm just like, it smells like cats in here all the time. I don't know what that's, what's that about. And we sought to renovate the house. We kind of did like a pseudo mini house flip. And so we renovated the house and we had demo day, which turned into like a demo week. And we just destroyed everything in the house, ripped up all the carpets, all the floors. Well, actually that was probably the easiest part of the renovation, for, like, for real, for real. Because I just had to destroy things. Went in the bathroom, was crushing vanities, ah! It was amazing, but I mean, it was super easy. It didn't take any skill or creativity or, you know, or thought. What got difficult is when we had to start repairing things, when we had to start making new things. That's where creativity and thoughtfulness and, and, and work ethic and effort came in. And so I would say as followers of Jesus to, to cancel, cancel culture, to get away from this, it's gonna take us following the example of Jesus. And in response to that, being a little more creative, being a little more innovative, maybe taking the extra work, going the extra mile to help actually bring resolution, restoration, and something new from the situation. So in this series, we've given you kind of four things to do to cancel cancel culture or to respond to cancel culture. One, we said, hey, if someone says something they shouldn't say or does something they shouldn't do, all you gotta do is either engage with them or just unfollow them. And with unfollowing, that's not a sin, that's not a crime. You don't have to follow everyone. If they're putting some negative energy in your life or you're just like, man, it's just kind of relentless. I just, I, I love you in real life. I'm here for you if you need me, but like, I can't follow you anymore. It's just, it's causing stress, man. You can unfollow. Or you can simply engage with them. And we said, if you're gonna do that, do it one on one, which we'll talk about later. Don't put it on their comment thread. Don't get out in the open with it. Just address them one on one. And we said, Second thing, as you do that, make sure that you always lead with love. Don't come aggressively, that's part of cancel culture. Lead with love, 
they respond in a certain kind of way, you respond with grace and then you forgive always. Even if they don't ask for your forgiveness, even if you don't think they deserve forgiveness, you forgive anyway. And then we've also been teaching you guys, third thing, you gotta hold judgment and mercy equally. Hold both judgment and mercy equally. I said I want you guys to be discerning, to have good biblical wisdom to go, wait a second, that doesn't mean, nah, blah, 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 that's wrong. Biblically, I know, that's wrong. That's okay, you can't judge what they said and determine it's right or wrong. In line with Jesus or not, biblical or not. But then, you cannot take it too far and condemn people and cancel them. Nah, you respond with mercy because mercy triumphs over judgment. Judgment good, mercy is what will supersede that. It's what Jesus did for us, it's what we do for other people. Lastly, fourth thing we, we said, to cancel cancel culture, to respond to it, you have to realize that people can change and can be made new. And that's actually exactly what Brian talked about last week. My man Brian came in, knocked it out of the park, did a fantastic job last week. And we actually looked at a case study. We looked at a biblical example of someone who was able to change and was able to become new. And we actually talked about the Apostle Paul. And how he actually persecuted the early church and hated them. Then my man had an encounter with Jesus that, that totally changed him. And then he actually wanted to help the early church and serve the, the early church and take the gospel out. But then the early church was like, nah, bro, <laughs> did you not get the memo? We, are, we done canceled you already. Like, yeah, you're done. Like, you were coming at us? No, you're canceled. And we talked about how, you know what? Someone actually gave Paul a new opportunity, gave him a chance. And it was our boy Barnabas. He actually came alongside Paul, encouraged him, defended him, and said, nah, he's changed. He's been made new. And so this week, I want to wrap things up by focusing in on the character of Paul, focusing in on this person who had been canceled. And so today, if you have been canceled, whether on social media, with a group of friends, uh, even in just like a one-to-one -one relationship, if you've been canceled, this one's for you. However, if you're watching and somehow in all your years, you've managed to somehow not get canceled by anyone, which I don't think that's ever happened, I want us to look at today's content from two perspectives. If you've been canceled, but it's also good to know what someone who has been canceled should go through, needs to go through, and is going through. Because once you've been canceled, the, the ways you have to respond, it's not easy. But Jesus is walking alongside us with and in it, and the Holy Spirit is at our back, pressing us forward as we try to maneuver into this ugh, perilous situation. So before I get into some steps, for, uh, to respond to being canceled. Some steps to take if you've been canceled. I wanna give you two, <laughs> two pieces of news. I got some good news and some bad news. If you're like me, I want the bad news first. The bad news is, if you've been canceled, you gotta own it. You have to own it. You have to endure the consequences of what you said or what you did. You got us. Uh, you have to maybe suffer the ramifications, the outcomes, the repercussions of what you've done. That's just part of it. And sometimes it's not easy. And know that I know that. I know that I'm with you in that if you've been canceled. Again, social media, group of friends are one on one. That's the bad news. The good news, however, is that as a follower of Jesus, if you've been canceled, you can take solace and take rest in the fact that you are already forgiven. The Bible does not mince words on this. This is part of the gospel. You already are forgiven. Before you even sin, you're already forgiven. Now we'll talk about steps of what we should go through. There's still a healthy healing process, repentance process. We'll go through that, but you're already forgiven. It says, we'll get to this later, in the New Testament that in, therefore in Christ you are a new creation. The old is gone, the new is here. You're already new, you're already forgiven. That's the good news. So you can start on this journey of responding to being canceled knowing that you are already forgiven, already made new. And the most important way between you and the Lord, and now you can set out to make peace and restitution with everybody else. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna give you six steps for responding to being canceled. Six steps I want you to walk through if you've been canceled. First thing that you have to do 
is you have to realize, this sounds so simple, but it's important. It's integral to the whole rest of the process. You have to realize that you said something you shouldn't say or you did something you shouldn't have done. Now, maybe it was objectively wrong, biblically wrong. I always hold a biblical worldview. I interpret everything through that. Maybe it was actually wrong, or maybe it wasn't necessarily a matter of right or wrong, but you really hurt somebody. You have to realize that. It kind of starts there. Now, there's different ways to realize that. And let's talk through some filters. If you say something on social media and a large group of people, and I would say this is kind of important for, for you too, if you're a follower of Jesus, if a lot of Jesus followers too go, whoa, what did you say? But even at that, even if you're not a Jesus follower, if a lot of people respond in a certain kind of way, it doesn't make them right, but I do think it gives us cause to pause and go, whoa, whoa, whoa that made a lot of people angry. Whoa, hold on. And in the Bible, we believe that there's something called common grace. There's certain things you can, the Apostle Paul writes about this in Romans chapter one. There's certain things that kind of all people go, wait a minute, that doesn't seem right. So if there's certain like hateful speech, hateful actions, just being unkind and cruel, most people I would say will go, hey, whoa, why, why'd you say that? Or why'd you do that? That's wrong. So sometimes, again, if there's an angry mob of people, it doesn't mean they're right necessarily. We'll talk through some other filters, but it, it should give you cause to pause if enough people are saying something. That's kind of your first filter. Secondly, I would say, seek wise counsel in your life. If you said something and you're like, I don't know why so many people got upset about this. I don't know why so many people got mad. Go talk to some wise people you trust, your group leader, your parents. You can talk to me about it. I don't know if I would call myself wise like that, but, but maybe you think so. I am older than you, so I can kind of big brother a little bit. Seek some wisdom and be like, what? I didn't mean it like this, but people are, or I don't think I said anything wrong. I'm gonna push back. Go seek some wise counsel. Have those people in your life. Not necessarily that are just older, not necessarily people that are just smarter, though both of those help, but someone who has more maybe biblical acumen than you, who has more experience in the word, who knows, who's been a follower of Jesus for a while and go, <laughs> bro, let me, let me, let me, uh, <laughs> let me big brother you real quick. I've, I've done this before. I've been here. So listen to a crowd sometimes. Sometimes there's a point. At least give cause to pause. Seek wise counsel, but everything will come back to and rest upon the Word of God. As a ministry, we have a biblical worldview. We always come back to the Word. And so, if what the crowd is saying lines up with the Word of God, if what your wise counsel is saying lines up with the Word, then that, that's the ultimate litmus test. And then go to the Word, look at it. Like, what does it say about this? What does it say about that? Well, like, am I out of line biblically? That's the most important thing. Because maybe what I said actually wasn't wrong, it was just unpopular. Maybe I'm actually kind of right. The prophets in the Bible, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, they said stuff all the time that made lots of people mad, but they were right about it because the Lord told them to say it. So, or even maybe in a relationship, you said something and you're like, I know I was right about it. I wasn't trying to be mean. You might actually be right. But I think the extra layer of caution we can take is, mm, how am I communicating this? Am I still being kind? Am I being helpful? Am I being winsome with this? Or am I just like, going about it the wrong way. I think that's something that's helpful. Lastly, I would say, if you are a follower of Jesus, I know we have people that are and aren't watching, but as a follower of Jesus, and this can be anybody, you can take steps towards that, we'll talk about later. You have the Holy Spirit. You are imbued with, empowered by the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And you are given, the Holy Spirit is a, um, a helper. It helps us discern things. And so there's things in my life where I'm like, man, societally, this is not clear. Biblically, I think it's, I, I think I know what it's saying, but Lord, please give me wisdom and discernment to, to figure this out. Holy Spirit, guide me as I try to navigate this. All these things can work together to help you realize whether something you said or something you did was wrong, especially if it causes a certain reaction. So first of all, realize what you did, take assessment. And if you come to the point where you're like, yeah, that was wrong. Or if you even come to the point where you go, you know what? It was hurtful, and that's probably the most important thing. It was really hurtful. It's not really a matter of biblically right or wrong. It's just a matter of I just hurt someone. Then you take the second step, and the second step is confess. You have to confess. Now, we have all kinds of negative connotations around this, like confess means like, oh, I'll go to jail, or like in a court of law, they're like, confess. You, have to, you gotta confess, or in an interrogation, like, yeah, you gotta confess. Confession is good and right. There's actually a biblical pattern of confession, and there's this part of the Bible called Psalms. 
it's these prayers and songs that people would sing corporately as a body of believers. And there's different genres of psalms. So just like in music, there's different genres, there's different kind of songs on an album. The psalms have different varieties. And one of them is a psalm of confession, or um, <laughs> the fancy word is a psalm of penitence. And so let me just read you a couple excerpts here from the psalms. Psalm 32 is one, and this is what the writer says. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me. It was like this guilt. My strength was dried up by the heat, of, or as the heat of summer. This other psalm, the psalmist goes on to say, same guy. There is no soundness in my flesh because of your indignation. Lord, I know you're mad at me, is what he's saying. There is no health in my body because of my sin. For my iniquities have gone over my head. Like there's so many, it's over my head. Like a heavy burden, they are heavy for me. So my man is just like weighed down by all of the things that are wrong and, and, and he's confessing it to the Lord. I, I know I did this wrong. And then in Psalm 51 it says, Psalmist says this, same guy, for I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. I know, I know what I did. Against you, you only have I sinned, Lord, and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. So the psalmist just, it just puts himself on blast, this is for real. And he's like, yeah, no, I, I, I did stuff I shouldn't have done. And this biblical confession is perfect, and it actually puts us in the perfect posture before the Lord. That's the first step. We'll talk about the second step with others. But here's, here's what I love. The end of that psalm, Psalm 51, verse 17, it says, The sacrifices of God, those things to honor the Lord, are a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. And so it is good and right for us to come to the Lord and go, you know what, I realized what I said was either completely wrong or completely hurtful. Lord, I'm sorry. That's on me. I know my sin. I know my weight. I know my guilt. And, and, and I'm sorry. And it's good to confess. Again, a biblical pattern. Through the story of the scripture, you see people confess all the time. The people of Israel turn away from God, do stuff they shouldn't do. And they say, Lord, as a, as a group of people, they say, sorry, we've sinned against you. We've done stuff we shouldn't do. Generations later, the generations that followed these Israelites that did stuff they shouldn't have done and, and said stuff they shouldn't have done and worshiped false gods and did all these horrible practices, they too go, sorry, our ancestors did this. Did this. Sorry, we did this. We're sorry. We confess this to you, Lord. Even if uh, some of you are familiar with the story of Jonah, when Jonah goes to the Ninevites and gives like a pretty weak sermon because he, he doesn't want them to repent, when they repent, they cry out to the Lord and they go, we're sorry. Ah, we shouldn't have done this. We're out of line. We're really sorry. Confession is important. I would say nothing can happen before you realize and before you confess. None of the other steps to healing or reconciliation can happen. But here's the deal. We know on this side of the cross that if we confess our sins, it says this in 1 John 1, 9, that if we confess our sins, He, the Lord, is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of unrighteousness. Like I said, we're already forgiven. And it's a beautiful truth. So as we confess what we've done to the Lord, which is the first and most important aspect of confession, we're already forgiven. But that step is still important. You still gotta own it, like I said. But then it doesn't stop there. We have to confess things to one another. So this book, later on in the New Testament, James, James tells these, this body of believers, this, this church, he's like, hey, confess your sins to one another. In James 5, 16, he says, he says, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. And what's so interesting is, is this is kind of framed in a context of health. Like James believed that there was something actually like healthy, almost like spirit, spiritually, emotionally, and almost physically healthy of confessing your sins to one another. I don't know about you guys, but like there's been times in my life where I'm like, I, 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 gotta, I, gotta, I gotta make something right with this person. Like I, I gotta text them, I gotta, I gotta get it out. I feel like it's like almost like poison in your body if you just keep what you've done wrong in, or you just sit on it and you're like, nah, I'm not gonna say anything. Man, it feels good to get it out there, just to confess it, and that is a good, right, biblical thing to do. Again, knowing you're forgiven, you seek forgiveness from others. And as Jesus' followers, we always give forgiveness. Again, forgive always, we've talked about that. So, if you've been canceled, if you said something you shouldn't have said or did something you shouldn't do, maybe you need to apologize to someone one-on-one, -on -one, to a group of people, Maybe even on social media. And that's a risk. People recently have apologized on social media and people go, oh, a nice apology. Let's put them on blast. And then 
It, it almost made it worse. You know what? I still would say it's an integrity move to always apologize. And it's not always gonna be easy. But I've also seen people apologize and people rush to defend them. And I've seen comment sections where like, hey, we got you, man. We know, mm, you're good. Thank you for apologizing. I needed that, whatever. So make sure you realize, you confess. And then third thing, we don't use this word a lot. You have to repent. Now that's a word we don't use a lot, but I want us to start using it, okay? This is a word that's, again, integral to the Bible. In the Old Testament, the word for repent is shuv. It's a verb. It means literally to turn, to go a different direction. And it's internal and it's external. So sometimes people are told to turn from their lust, turn from their hatred. But sometimes people are called to turn away from uh, pursuing violence, turn away from worshiping false gods and being disobedient. They're supposed to turn. And this group of people called the prophets in the Old Testament would always speak to power and say, hey, y'all doing some stuff you shouldn't do. You need to turn, you need to shoo and go a different direction, both internally and in terms of your actions, because the two are always tied. What you think and what you feel will lead to what you do oftentimes. You gotta turn all of it. So if, you, if, you, if what you said or did came from a certain thing you believe or a certain practice that you've been in the habit of, you gotta turn that around. Because just realizing it and confessing it isn't enough. I've had people in my life that do the same thing over and over and over and over again, and they'll say, oh, sorry, ugh, sorry, but they keep doing it. There wasn't actual repentance. They didn't turn. In the New Testament, the word for repentance is this Greek word, metanoia. And it actually has to do with the mind, the changing of mind, the turning of mind. And again, how you think and how you will oftentimes be influenced or um, even impact how you feel and that will influence how you act. And so it's all connected. And so you have to turn the way you think. And if you are in the habit of thinking a certain way, man, then you'll start to feel that way. And out of the overflow of the heart speaks the mouth. And so you gotta start turning those two things around. Now, if you're like, is that, is that legit? Well, Jesus, throughout the Gospels, calls people to metanoia. He calls people, that's, that's the, the noun form, but he calls them to repent. Again and again and again and again and again. In the Gospels, Jesus calls people to repent, repent, repent. Turn from what you're doing. Turn from your ways. In the book of Acts, right after the Gospels, we're going through this as a, as a church and with Metro, the disciples preach sermons. You know what they tell people to do? Repent. Turn from what you're doing. Turn from your ways. Change your thinking. Change what you're feeling. Change your whole worldview. Change your actions. Turn. And so if you really want to repent and to seek reconciliation, if you've been canceled, you have to not only realize, not only confess, but you have to repent. Now let me give you a little practical big bro advice. Sometimes I think repentance can look like sadness. I think it's okay to feel sad about something, to mourn something. And I even think repentance can be expressed in silence. There's this guy in the Old Testament, Job, and his whole story is really complex and fascinating. But Job, he gets to this place where like he had said some stuff to the Lord that he shouldn't have said. He went a little too far and he had this attitude that was a little too far. And so he's got to repent and he says, Lord, I will not speak and I will repent in the dust and the ash. I'm sorry. You're the one who's in charge. And my man actually just says like, I'm going to just, I'm going to be quiet. The Apostle Paul, who we talked about last week, who's kind of our frame of reference for this week, someone who got canceled but then could change and become new. Paul, once he became a Jesus follower, we find this out later in the New Testament, I believe in the, in the book of Galatians or in the letter to the Galatians, Paul says, I mean, once I became a Jesus follower, I actually took some time to get out and get away. And that's where I feel like the Lord did some work in me, did some work on me. So maybe if you've been canceled, maybe you need to lay low for a while. I've seen some people realize they said something wrong, confess they did something wrong, and then they, I, I don't know if I saw full repentance because once they kind of apologized, they went right back to like, okay, so anyway, where was I? And I was like, I don't know, Would you, were you really contrite about that? Were you really real about that? Would you, maybe you need to like get off social, maybe lay low for a while, let the Lord move and work in you to help you kind of change your thinking, change your feeling, change your, your, your actions. So maybe that's you, maybe you need to get off Insta for a while. Maybe you need to get off TikTok for a while. Maybe just cancel all social media and go, you know what, I'm going to take some time with the Lord to grow, to mature. Maybe that's what you need to do as part of your repentance.
Maybe if, if you had a violation with someone or you said something you shouldn't have said, you say, hey, I'm gonna give you some space to heal and process this. I'm gonna go kind of lay low. I'm, I'm very sorry. I'm, I'm, we're working on it. So realize, confess, repent. Fourth thing, this one's a little ambiguous and, and they go way quicker from here. You repair. If there was damage done, you have to repair the damage that has been done. In the Old Testament, in the book of Exodus, is, is a, <laughs> now this isn't going on anymore, I don't think, but if you stole someone's cow, you'd have to pay back like four cows. Or like certain animals, it's like if you took one, you have to replace the one and then add another one. You had to like go above and beyond to make it right with someone. This is in the book of Exodus. And in the same holds true today. In the New Testament, there's this guy named Zacchaeus. And he's a tax collector and he's like fraudulently taking money from people, taking more than he should. He becomes a follower of Jesus. He flips the script, as Brian talked about last week. And then Jesus is like, bro, I would uh, probably go ahead and like go make restitution with everyone and go repay what you owe. And, and, and Zacchaeus goes and does that. And he repays people what he owed them. And so that was part of his repairing the relationship. And so I would say if you hurt someone with your words or hurt a group of people with your words, whatever, on social media, you got to make it right. And I don't know, sometimes there's nothing you can do besides apologize and repent. But if there is something you can do to make it right, then you need to do that. And this is probably on a more like uh, interrelational level, interpersonal and relational level. So make it right. Um, and <laughs> The book of Matthew, it actually says that. Jesus says, if you're at the altar, like you're doing a religious thing, and you're at the altar and you're making a sacrifice, and then you realize, I've wronged my brother in some kind of way. I've wronged my sister in some kind of way. Jesus is like, put it down, go make it right with them. That's how important it is. We need to seek out reconciliation and seek out repairing relationships. This is important as a Jesus follower. We'll talk about something else later where Jesus says, do the same thing when you're, when you're doing this. Um, Matthew 18 acts as kind of a guide. We use this around the church world all the time as a guide for if you have a conflict with someone, you got you to gotta go make it right with them. You go one-on-one -on -one with them. If they don't listen, you take another person. You go two-on-one. -on -one, try to make it right. Try to repair. If that doesn't work, then you can take maybe some people from the church and say, hey, this group of wise counsel on one. Let's make this right. Let's seek to repair. There's an impetus, there's a, almost like a command from us to actually go and do this thing, to make repair. In Romans 12, 18, Paul says this. He says, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with all people. And so that takes some effort on your part. As you've repented, you have to try to repair. Try to repair those relationships. Try to seek peace. Try to actively make peace and make amends with people. So after you... After you realize, after you confess, after you repent, after you seek to repair, then you can walk in newness because you know you've done everything that the Lord has expected and asked you to do. You've been a faithful follower of Jesus. You've done what you're supposed to do. And so don't be burdened down by guilt like the psalmist was talking about. Don't let it just rot and fester and you're like, I'm a horrible person. No, that's not what Jesus says about you. That's not how the Lord views you. And it actually says, in the book of Hebrews, I love this. Hebrews 8.12. This is a beautiful, beautiful passage. It says this. Talking about Jesus being our high priest. Jesus standing in for us and accepting our punishment and distributing mercy and forgiveness. It says, Jesus says, For I will be merciful toward their sins, or their iniquities is the word that's used here, and I will remember their sins no more. It's almost like once we've been canceled and we've gone through these steps and we're like, Jesus, I'm sorry, Lord, I, forgive me. It's almost like Jesus is like, for what? It's already taken care of. That's the scandalous nature of grace. That's what literally no other religion actually gets. You always have to like, do, 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 like do stuff to earn favor, like work your way back up. Nah, it's already given. So that's why don't get it twisted. All the steps I've walked you through, Mm, that's just a good, right, and godly thing to do. That is to help make peace with other people. But again, I started out with the good news that you're already forgiven. And it says, like I said in 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old is gone, the new is here. In Ephesians 4.22, it says, Hey, put on the new self. Don't put on the old self. If you said something you shouldn't say or did something you shouldn't have done, yeah, that's Put that behind you and that's old you. You're always walking in newness. In Colossians 3.10, it says the same thing. Put off the old and put on the new, which is being renewed in the likeness of Jesus. <clears throat> and so that's beautiful news. You are actually actively being made new. No one is canceled. 
Brian said it last week, the cross cancels cancel culture. If the cross is true, cancel culture can't be. You are forgiven and you're not only new, but you're constantly being made new. And as a follower of Jesus, that is central to our faith. Don't, don't come out talking about, I'm gonna be a better person. And Jesus is making me a better me. That's not the point of the Christian life. It's actually being made new in the likeness of Jesus. So we say, hey, the word, preaching, worship, it all should be making us more like Jesus. This process of reconciliation, this is making us more like Jesus. So realize, confess, repent, repair, walk in the newness. And then last thing, remember. Always remember the forgiveness you've been shown. Because, <laughs> like we said at the beginning of the series, Paul is writing a letter to, his, to his, his little bro in ministry, Timothy. And he goes, hey, Timothy, here's a helpful saying from me, this super spiritual guy. Christ died for sinners, of which I'm the worst. So Paul even has this notion of like, oh, don't think I forgot where I came from. <laughs> no, don't know. No, I know I got, I got canceled. Like, I know I was horrible, okay? I, I remember that. And you know, with celebrities, they always say like, don't, don't forget where you came from. You know, or if people kind of work their way up, it's like, hey, don't forget where you came from. As a, as a follower of Jesus, don't forget where you came from. Walk in newness, realize you're being made new, but don't forget where you came from. Hold judgment. You can judge something as a follower of Jesus, but then you always meet it with mercy. And in fact, Jesus in his most famous sermon in Matthew 5, he said, blessed are the merciful, for, for they will be shown mercy. So we gotta remember <laughs> that we've messed up. And so we gotta be quick with that mercy. You gotta be quick with it. And through, actually, Jesus instituted and redeemed this meal that we now call communion or the Eucharist. It's actually Jesus taking Passover and kind of orienting it around himself. And this meal for centuries of the church has been a reminder to us of what Jesus has done. How he has died for us, he has, he has forgiven us, he was raised to life, he has called us into this new covenant where we already are forgiven, where we are being made new, where we are building his kingdom. Yeah, this meal called communion, if, if you've been in church, you've probably experienced this. Even if you haven't, you've probably heard of it. This meal always reminds us that we've been forgiven. And I, I think that's part of the reconciliation process with others. We realize what we've done, we confess it, we repent and we seek to turn and change. We repair how we can to make peace. Then we walk in newness and are being made new in the likeness of Jesus. And then we always kind of look back and remember, yeah, I remember how I was forgiven. Paul always did, man, Paul always did. So as we wrap this series, my hope and my prayer is that we look more and more like we are being made new in the likeness of Jesus every day. And that our lives and our social media reflect that. And we, <laughs> our lives and our social media look more like the kingdom of heaven, his kingdom come, his will be done, than the angry IG stories that he posted and the rants in the comment section on YouTube and TikTok. Mm, I hope we look more like the kingdom of heaven. And I would suggest to you, as just practical advice, big bro stuff, man, it's less stress walking in this too. Canceling cancel culture, less stress, less heavy, less drama. Be quick to judge rightly and then mm, follow without mercy. And lastly, may you not, as we operate in this cancel culture kind of environment, may you not pour, pour fuel in the fire. Hey! Instead, may you engage or unfollow. May you lead with love, respond with grace, and forgive always. May you hold judgment and mercy equally, and may you realize that people can change and can be made new. And that includes you if you've been canceled. So may we, as followers of Jesus, realize we've, for, we've been forgiven much and forgive much. And may we cancel, cancel culture. Grace and peace to you.